He was limping along the road with a badly wounded knee. It was almost dark, and no people had been seen in many hours. He was beginning to feel hungry and tired. A solitary tumbleweed brambled before him, frightening in its wake his weary soul. Trudging on would be fruitless. He had to find a place to rest. Not like last time. Not like that. He needed a safe place where he wouldn't be bothered. The type of place he had so long ago enjoyed with his family, where he could play in the yard and relax in his own soft bed. Those days were long gone. He waddled over to a small culvert by the road and lied down. He was fast asleep in a minute. When he woke, it was not to the pleasant desert birds that resounded their morning cries. It was the sound of a rickety old pickup, slowing to the side of the road. What was the man doing? This was one of the most desolate roads in the country, and stopping was not a common occurrence. As Max weighed his way out of the culvert, he lingered by some bushes next to the road, about fifty feet away, and watched. The man seemed confused. He scratched his balding, sunburned head and looked around, then down at the vehicle. Pulling an extra tire from the bed of the truck, he was about to go to work when they made eye contact. Oh no. The man had seen him. Jumping back at first, but then curious, the man began to talk softly. Are you alright, little buddy? What are you doing all the way out, way out here? Max prepared to bolt, but remained fixed by the man's demeanor and kind voice. Are you lost, buddy? Hell, you must be. There ain't no one around here for miles. Max sat tight. I bet you're a thirsty bugger. Here, hold on. I got some cold ones in the cab. The man wandered over to the cab and returned with a small cooler and an old cooking pan. He opened the water release on the cooler, and ice cold water began to pour out into the pan. In the searing desert sun, it was an oasis. As the man placed the pan on the ground and stepped back, Max knew what that meant. This was his water now. It was meant for him. As difficult as it was to trust again, he shuffled a few feet closer to the sparkling water. Come on, the man coaxed. It's all right. I won't hurt you. Go ahead, drink. The man retreated to his cab to give Max some space. He knew he'd been through a lot, and it was anyone's guess how long he'd been wandering in the desert. Max trotted up and began lapping frantically at the pan. He didn't stop until it was empty, and then looked up and around, licking his lips in approval. The man spent an hour or so, changing the tire, talking to Max. Max kept his distance, though, never approaching more than a few yards. When the man was finished, he said, Well, it's getting awful hot out here, and it's only going to get worse. What do you say I give you a ride out of here, pal? No response. Okay, I understand. I'm just going to get up in my truck and get her all fired up. I'll leave the passenger door open in case you change your mind. The old Chevy rumbled to life, and the man leaned out the window and back. You coming? he said. Max tilted his head in curiosity. Come on, boy. That was all the reassurance he needed. Max bound over and into the passenger seat. The man pulled the door shut, and they sat staring at each other, Max drooling all over the upholstery. Well, I'm Guy, said the man, and you must be. He slowly reached out and took a hold of the shiny tag on his collar. Max! Max! Well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Max. Max returned the compliment with a pant and a grin. Driving on for hours through the blistering summer heat, they stopped to grab a little shade whenever it was afforded. Roadside billboards, though decrepit remnants of a lost paradise, still offered a little retreat from the searing rays. The pickup was an old rusty-looking tow truck, Conversion. Out here in the desert, presentation of your business wasn't so important. If you came across a stranded motorist, it was unlikely that he would turn up his nose and say, No thanks, I'll wait for another one. It was the only business the man knew. Raised with little education and a knack for mechanical things, by the age of 15 he had already started his own auto repair business. Short-lived, he realized traveling was his passion, so he fixed up one of his old junkers into a tow truck and headed out on a permanent road trip. Now in his late twenties, he had seen almost every road in the southwest, looking for stranded vehicles and people in need of help. He was a kind fellow, with a good heart. Now he had a dog. What on earth was he going to do with this fellow? They rode on in silence, save the light breeze blowing through the cab. The seats were torn and faded, but Max offered no objection as he slept curled in a ball on the bench seat next to Guy. He smiled as he looked down at the tuckered mutt. Good boy, he said. Good old boy. And he patted Mike's, Max's head lightly. Max didn't budge. They stopped somewhere about a hundred miles east of Flagstaff. The air was cooler than usual, 
and there was a nice grove of trees to park under. He pulled the truck out of sight, and they sat in the waning light of the desert sun, watching the ball of fire slowly hide behind the distant mountains. Within a minute, they were both fast asleep. When Guy woke, he almost lost his bearings. He knew where he was, but something seemed different. What was it? Two more cars screamed by on the highway, about a hundred yards away. Then one more, then another. That's what it was. People. Seldom do you see people in such remote places, especially at 2 a.m. He wondered if it was some teenagers heading out to the cliffs for a party. They were about the only ones who came out on the road this far, as it was at least 300 miles to the next gas station. The only attractions were the peace and solitude abound, just right for college parties. But then two more cars, and another. He could see that one was passing the other two in a hurry. Definitely teenagers. Who else would drive so recklessly? You damn kids, he shouted into the stifling silence. Ain't no racing track out here. As he turned to walk back to the truck, he felt a peculiar vibration that seemed to resound through his every bone. Then silence. Total silence. He thought he would hear the departing teenagers revving up and screeching tires as they marauded through the plains, but he couldn't even see a tail light. He just heard a screech and a bump. Walking out to the highway, something was very eerie. The night seemed to encroach on him like a blanket, and the air was thick with an indescribable charge, almost static. Though the lights were gone, he swore he could hear faint voices intermittently on the wind. They seemed to come from up the road where the vehicles had been headed. They sounded scared, distraught, almost frantic. He figured the kids had been drinking a little too much and had a car accident. He headed back to his truck, where Max was still laying down, but his ears were alert and his head up. Well, Max, we gotta go see what in the hell is going on around here. Sounds like something's going on up the road. He turned the key on the ignition. Nothing. He tried the lights. Nothing. Well, God damn it! I know I turned off the damn lights. Max looked innocently away. I know, I know. Ain't your fault. I got a spare battery in the back. Can't be too careful around these parts. He rounded the back of the Chevy and retrieved one of several spare batteries he kept for potential customers. Most of them looked pretty shabby, but he kept them all fully charged. He popped the hood, switched out the old with the new. Then he turned the key and nothing. God damn it. Fuck. He rarely cursed with the F word, but here it was warranted. He pulled out his battery tester and found that the battery was fully charged. Well, what in the... He began to say when from somewhere in the distance he heard a whistling sound. Slowly, coming closer. It seemed to emanate from the south, which was strange, because there were no roads in that direction except old dirt access trails. Before he could grasp what it was, it was over his head, moving north at Godspeed. Holy shit, he said, as tree branches snapped above him in his little roadside grove. By the time he figured it out, the night sky was bleached out by a massive fiery explosion, about 200 yards away. Holy shit, he repeated. Holy shit, holy shit. When a majority of the fuel had burned up, he could see easily that it was a large plane. Using the light to his advantage, he scanned the highway to find the people he had heard. His eyes were still unadjusted after the explosion, but he could make out eight or so people up on the road, staring into the flames. Max was pacing intently around the truck, nervous-looking and observant. Come on, boy, let's go check them people out. They began marching up the road towards the anxious voices. It was about a quarter mile to where they were. As they approached within a few hundred feet, Guy called out, Is everyone okay? Silence followed, probably the shock of wondering where this man had come from. It's okay. I was parked down the road, and I... What in the hell is going on around here? We don't know, a voice answered. Our car just died. We can't get it started. We have to get out of here. Whoa now, said Guy. What's the hurry? A freaking plane just crashed, and y'all are... Where are y'all running from? Didn't you hear, said one man. Hear what? It was like a solar flare or an EMP or something. They said it was so something was coming, and that we'd all be screwed if it happened. All electrical stuff fried. Maybe some government test or some shit. Guy stared at the man. So that's what happened to the plane? We best get over there and try to help, he said. The man shook his head. No, no way. Look at the thing. It's toast. Nobody could survive that. Max cocked his head and barked. It was the first time he'd barked since Guy picked him up. What is it, boy? said Guy. Max took off at full speed, fading into the night towards the wreckage.